Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for adramofoutlander.com. For all things Outlander, from the Dinah Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and everything in between. This is episode 95, A Fugitive Green, week 5. Hello, this is our second to last episode on this new novella. It has been quite a joy ride, and this episode is going to be fun. Many is all things unexpected. <laughs> and I think from afar, she is falling in love with Hal. Where we left off when it comes to her and Hal last episode was they had met in the gardens after she had met Mr. Bloomer, who we know is Edward Twelve Trees now. And they had a very interesting an intimate conversation about Hal's life after he was struck in with asthma or asthma-like symptoms because of his grief over the third anniversary of his father's death. And then the next day, she met Edward Twelve Trees for real, his real name, and he commissioned her to get the letters that Harry Quarry had told her about. So she had two different jobs that were in direct opposition. <laughs> hmm. So we're sitting at this point with her trying to figure out what to do about this. Because she didn't really like 12 Trees. And she really does kind of like Hal, and she thinks that Harry is a good friend. And Hal is in the position of trying to get his regiment back up, the one that his father had started, the 46th. And he needs to prove that he is mentally stable and that he had true reason to kill Nathaniel Twelve Trees for the affair without exposing it through the letters because they are very raw and cruel, as we will find out. So chapter 13 the letters. So she had been going through and doing some work for a client. He liked Lithuanian illuminated manuscripts and Japanese erotica, and he had been a really valuable connection. She had gotten from him two 15th century incunabula, and what those are are books printed prior to 1501 or a work of art or of industry of an early period? And it comes from Latin. She re received two, one that was in great condition and one that needed a bit of repair. And the one that needed repair was an original by Maria Anna Agueda de San Ignacio, and she was an abbess from New Spain. And there were handwritten annotations from the nun herself. So Minnie is putting together all these things to take back to her father, and she has piles everywhere. They make sense to her, but they're all over. And she didn't trust anyone else to handle or pack books for shipment back to Paris. So she was dust stained and sweaty. Um, and it was just past midsummer day. So we're in late June and she'd come across another book called La Vida de la Alma, the life of the soul. And I tried to look this one up, but I really couldn't find a reference for it. And she reaches and touches one of the books and it gives her a sense of peace. I would venture to say many of us are that way, that we love books. You touch it and does it speak to you? Like the imagery we saw of Jamie running his hand along Lord Melton's, the Duke of Pardlow's library wall, trying to wait for a book to speak to him that says, read me. And that was in The Scottish Prisoner. And it seems that Minnie has 
the same type of sense. And her thought is books always had something to say beyond the words inside, but it was rare to find one with so strong a character. Every once in a while, they speak. And she opens it carefully. She notes that the paper was thin and the ink had begun to fade with age but didn't blur. There were very few illustrations across the Lamb of God, the pectin shell. She thought she has to ask her father about the significance. She'd been trying not to think of him very much because of all the emotions surrounding her mother and him. And she thought of Sister Emmanuel. She still felt loss and sorrow, but this book gave her a sense of peace that sheltered her like a covering wing. I often joke that to my marriage, I brought two cats, a refrigerator, and my Outlander books. And we got married 23 years ago, so there weren't that many Outlander books at the time. But the third book really helped get me through a divorce. I had started reading the books right when they came out. And not too long after, I went through a divorce for my first marriage. So the impact of Outlander on my life has been greatly significant. So the husband I've had for all these years only knows my life with Outlander in it. <laughs> and I think he's grateful and he puts up with my habits and all the time I spend on it. So I find that the first three Outlander books were really a shelter for me. And she remembers her mother asking if she was an angel. And she knew she would have to speak to her father. Oh, that's going to be a difficult one. And she says to the book, if you have any answers, please pray for me, for us and its author. She wiped her face with the hem of her dusty apron. She wasn't really crying but her eyes were damp. And then there was a knock at the door. Her lady maid had gone to do some shopping, so she opened the door just as she was. It was the O'Higginses standing next to each other. We've got the letters, Bedelia, Rafe said. All the letters. <laughs> so apparently they didn't just get the Esme's letters and Nathaniel's. They got all the letters out of Hal's desk. They explained they waited for the butler to be gone and that they pretended to be chimney sweeps and they were to attend the library chimney. But since the butler wasn't there that day, they let him in. And they had filled a bag with letters from the desk. So Minnie was going to have to sort through all of these. And she tells them that it was well done as long as they found Esme's letters in this stack. And then she inquires if they got paid for sweeping the chimney. Sure, and you wound us, Lady Bedelia. Of course we did, Mick said, grinning. Of course we did. Twouldn't have been convincing otherwise, would it? Oh, the O'Higginses in this light are so fun. They're not so fun in the Scottish prisoner. And Diana uses the phrase, they were cock a hoop over their success. So, of course, I looked the word up and it means triumphantly boastful, exalting. They were being festive. They took about half a bottle of Madeira to celebrate before they left. And she notices a smudge of soot on the white doorknob and wipes it off. Can you imagine her taking all these letters and putting them in different piles? The ones from Esme, who is Lady Melton, to her lover, Nathaniel Twelve Trees. Those were the ones in the wooden box. 
And then there were ribboned bundle of letters, and those were from Nathaniel to Esme. But the leather folder had something she didn't expect. The letters from Harold Lord Melton to his wife. I still can't figure out why Hal would have kept all the letters. Some are of proof. Maybe he still loved Esme. Maybe he was trying to make sense of it. How did he come across them in the first place? These are all really good questions. As part of being an intriguer and intelligencer, like she is, it's normal for her to read people's letters, and but they're not real to her. She's actually met Hal and spent some intimate time with him. And so she knew this was not going to be simple. She would never know Esme or Nathaniel in person, but looking at the letters that Hal wrote made her prickle. She decides to read Esme's first because she was the center of it all. And these were the letters she'd been commissioned to steal. She smelled a hint of perfume and then something kind of bitter, fresh, mysterious, myrrh, nutmeg, dried lemon. Hmm. Not sweet. But she didn't think that Esme Gray was sweet either. The letters were not dated, and she sorted through them in an order that made the most sense. It was an expensive, stationary, but she said the sentiments upon them were not pure at all. Mon cher, dois-je vous dire ce que je voudrais que me fassiez? Shall I tell you what I want you to do to me? Minnie had read a stock of erotica of her father's when she was 14, when she discovered it. And she learned in the process that one didn't necessarily need a partner to experience the sensations so euphorically described therein. Well, it's good. So she discovered masturbation, it sounds like, and orgasm. Better to learn your own body before you share it with somebody else. She didn't think that Esme had much literary style, but she was very imaginative. And she freely and bluntly expressed it. This made Minnie squirm a little bit. All the letters were not that way. She said one was a simple two-line note, another thoughtful, and an intimate letter describing Esme's visit to... Whew... Princess Augusta and her fabulous garden. Esme said in her letter she did not like the princess. She thought she was heavy in mind and body. But that Hal had asked her to accept the, had asked her to accept the invitation to tea. It was a way to pave Hal back to his military designs with the prince. She describes walking through the glass conservatories with the princess. And in her writing, she compared her lover's physical parts with various exotic plants. She mentioned the euphorbias and the chew flowers. Allez regarder mon âme, c'est apaisé. It's soothed my soul to look at them. <laughs> And Minnie says to herself, you poor man. And she was thinking of Hal. She needed to drink wine as she's going through this process of reading these letters. Esme Gray had definitely been real. Her personality was so strong, it was palpable. She says it reached out of the paper and stroke her correspondent's face, teasing, erotic. Minnie thought Esme was cruel because she would write her lover and mention her husband. She looks over at the bundle of Nathaniel Twelve Trees letters to his mistress. Why had Melton kept them? Was it guilt? 
For what then? For killing Nathaniel twelve trees, guilt over Esme's death. She wondered how quickly the one event had followed the other. Was it the shock of hearing of her lover's death that brought on the miscarriage or fatally early labor? She may never get the answers to these questions. But Melton may have killed Nathaniel, but he left the poet's voice in the stack of letters. She poured more wine, and this was a Bordeaux. She needed a ballast as she unfolded Nathaniel's letters. She said he was a pedestrian writer for being a poet. Sufficient, but very common. And he was clearly not a match for Esme in imagination or expression. But he was a poet. There was mention of poems written to Esme, but she could not find them. They were not with the letters. Did Melton burn those, or maybe Esme? And she says that Nathaniel's tone in presenting these literary gifts reminded her of a naturalist description she had read of a type of male spider who brought his chosen mate an elaborately silk-wrapped parcel containing an insect and then leapt upon her while she was absorbed in unwrapping her snack, hastily achieving his purpose before she could finish eating and have him for dessert. <laughs> Do you think it's Lawrence Stern she's referring to here? I bet. That's where Jamie had first met him, and she had been in Paris. That's where she lives. And she notes that Esme scared Nathaniel and that Esme probably knew it. She invoked Hal's name in all the letters to Twelve Trees. Was it to get him more fond of her and jealous of her having a husband? Minnie wants to know why. As she has these stacks and these sheets in front of her, she thinks it looks a bit like the layout of the tarot. And as her mind wandered to the tarot for a moment, she decided she had no opinion regarding the truth that tarot cards gave. But she had definite opinions about letters. And she was thoughtful about them. Where had Esme's letters come from? Did the Twelve Trees send them to hurt Hal? But she thinks that would have taken a subtlety that they didn't have. And what made him challenge Twelve Trees in the first place? She didn't think that Esme had confessed the affair. Now Colonel Quarry said it was from the letters. So she picks up the Countess's letters again, and she frowned. And then as she really looks at the letters closely, she thinks that these may have been drafts later copied into a prettier form to be sent to Nathaniel. Why would she not throw the drafts into the fire and why keep them and risk discovery? Or she invited it. She thinks that Esme left them on purpose for Hal to discover. And she shook her head as the wine fumes mingled with the dead countess's bitter perfume. Pauvre chien, she said softly. Poor bitch. <laughs> so, she doesn't even know Esme. And from what she's read, what she's heard, yeah, woman was a bitch. Even Hal said so. I love that line. The wine fumes mingling with the dead countess's bitter perfume. Rose and something bitter. So sharp, pointed. Roses are beautiful, but they have thorns. And Esme Gray absolutely, unequivocally had thorns about her. And she was acerbic and unforgettable. Men loved her. Women hated her. So I think we get a really good picture of Esme. And the way that Minnie is going through this process, how it's so affecting her, 
There's more going on, and I think she's willing to admit. She thinks she just likes him, and she wants some sort of justice for him, and she does not like 12 trees. She's trying to puzzle it all out. I can't imagine at 17 years old having such a level of maturity to deal with these things, but hence it's her life. Chapter 14 Notorious Bores. She didn't think she had to read Lord Melton's letters, but she couldn't stop herself either. And when she picked one up, it felt like a lit grenade that might go off in her hand. So she had a pretty lengthy conversation with Hal, or he with her rather. She simply listened to most of it when he was telling about his father's death and his family and the things that were going on. She really got a spark of what he's like. And she saw that fierceness in him. She knows the sound of his voice. And she's seen the vulnerability in him that he doesn't share with anybody else, save maybe Harry Corey. She read the five letters without stopping. They had no dates. And she couldn't tell what order they had been written in. Time did not matter to the writer. She says this was the voice of a man pushed off a cliff into the abyss of eternity and documenting his fall. Oh, poor, poor Hal. I know it's hard, or difficult rather, to really like Hal. He took part in that terrible aftermath of Culloden. And basically raising the highlands to the ground. Doing horrible things because he was charged to do it. Country and crown and duty. There's a lot to be said that soldiers should not just blindly listen but they're supposed to listen and they're supposed to follow orders. And he was following orders. They were stamping out treasonous activity. Minnie reads, I will love you forever. I cannot do otherwise, but by God, as may, I will hate you forever with all the power of my soul. And had I you before me and your long white neck in my hands, I would strangle you like a fucking swan and fuck you as you died. You dot, dot, dot. And she describes it as he may as well have picked up the inkwell and flung it at the page. The words were scrawled and blotted, big and black, ragged. Holes torn through the paper. It looked like he had stabbed the page with his quill. Minnie was shaking at the end of the reading of the final letter. She wasn't weeping, but it was so devastating for her. She could barely breathe. The final letter just dropped to the floor, weighted with loss and grief that didn't cut, but clawed and merciless tore its prey to bloody ribbons. Like she felt his pain and his anguish. Wow. Those are some strong words. Imagine being the person who that's intended for reading that. Imagine the crushing feelings inside of Hal to write those words. She didn't read his letters again. She would never forget any word upon any of the pages but she had to get some air. She had to walk in order to regain her composure. As she did so, she felt tears and blotted them quickly so no one asked if she was okay. She felt beat up, like she'd been crying just for days. And it had nothing to do with her, but it was so real. She knew one of the O'Higginses was following behind her, but he hung back. And she walked from one end to the other of St. James Park, all the way around the lake. And she finally sat down near swans. 
her mind and body exhausted. Do any of you have to do that? I do. If things are very stressful, I could walk and walk and walk and walk. I like Minnie. I love how Diana writes these characters that have such real life emotions and needs and they function just like we do and stress hits them and they don't know how to hold on to it properly. They don't know what to do with it. So she had to go and process. It was now tea time, which is mid afternoon, three, four o'clock and people were going home to refresh themselves. So people ate dinner pretty late. If they're having a tea, which is a small bites, they won't be hungry for dinner until eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night. Mick was nearby and he coughed and she says she's not hungry and he can go on. I love this. Now, Bedelia, you'll know fine. I'm not going anywhere. You don't go. Shall I be fetching you a pie now? Whatever's the trouble, it'll seem better on a full belly. <laughs> oh, the wisdom of the O'Higgins. She said, okay, and she gets a pie. And she realizes when she takes a bite that she absolutely needed to eat. There now. Better, is it not? And it was. And... It had helped her think more clearly as she was turning things over in her mind. And the truth of the matter is Esme and Nathaniel were dead. But Harold, how the theoretical Duke of Pardlo wasn't. And that's what it came down to for her. She could do something about him. And she realizes she was going to. She was determined to do so. So now she's on Team Hal, and he's not just a mark, and she wants to find a way to help him succeed, and she is not going to do what Edward Twelve Trees wants. So she explains to Mick generally what's going on, and that the letters, as they are, cannot go to the Secretary of War. And it would kill Hal to find out that people who had power over him had read those letters. So they sit and talk this through and they're strategizing and brainstorming. And the O'Higginses are really good at this, actually, better than I thought they would be. So if it can't be the letters, as Mick points out, or she won't use them, there has to be another way. So maybe get a false witness, bribe somebody, and they mull that over for a bit, but she says, most young women aren't good liars at all. And he agrees and says, you're one of a kind, so you are. <laughs> so if that wasn't the case, they could start a rumor, but you could never control what happens with rumors. So they decide to shelve that one. And then they think, what else might work? Or might, what might his honor, her father, recommend? And she says, well, forgery, most likely. But doesn't think writing a false version of the letters would be a great deal better than showing the originals. Hmm. So she asks for another pie because she discovers that thinking is a very hard and hungry work. <laughs> so she starts thinking about Esme's letters again. Hmm. Because she was the Fons e Torigo in all of this misery, which means the source and origin of something. And then she wonders if Esme would think it was all worth it. I mean, she probably was only trying to make her husband jealous. And she had likely little intent of causing her husband to shoot one of his friends. And she hadn't intended on dying along with her child. And this somehow made her think of her mother. I don't suppose you intended anything that happened either. You certainly didn't intend me. Still, we're, we both survived. Where Esme and her child and her lover had not. 
And she, Minnie, is glad to be here, and she's pretty sure her father is happy about it, too. So Mick pulls her from her thoughts, and they start walking because it's getting late. So Mick has been thinking, too, and brings up the fact that Nathaniel was a poet and asks if she's familiar with any of his poems, and she's not. And so he's thinking, hmm, if forgery it is, can she forge her something that might be helpful? What about write a poem for him to Esme? Ooh, this is intriguing to Minnie. She's really mostly only written a false letter. Nothing major in forgery. And here's what Mick has to say. Still, you have got some of the man's letters to work from. Could you maybe trace a few words here and there and add in between like? And she thinks maybe, but it's not just handwriting. It has to be a decent facsimile. It has to resemble the real persons. And he was trying to mouth the word facsimile. And he's got his wheel spinning and he says, so writing a poem is different than writing a letter. And she says, yes. But Mick points out, then Nathaniel was not likely in the habit of writing love poems to the Secretary of War. But once a letter gets to the Secretary of War or a poem, it can be given to somebody else who knows what Nathaniel's writing was like. So she's trying to figure out a way around this because they don't want it going back to Lord Melton as if he accidentally was caught writing this letter. If somebody figured out it was not from Nathaniel. So she decides that she's going to ask Lady Buford whether Nathaniel ever published any poetry. And if she could read some of it, then she might be able to do it. Me money's on you, Lady Bedelia. So she brings the question to Lady Buford. And it turns out, though he had not publicly published anything, because um, it didn't seem worthy of printing, according to others, that he had some privately printed for the edification of his friends. And Minnie also knows that there were poems alluded to in the letters that she just read through. So they have to be somewhere. So she's wondering where they are. And so she asks Lady Buford if Countess Melton was fond of poetry. She said the only thing that Esme ever read was the Bible. And this really took Minnie aback for a moment until Lady Buford said she wasn't religious, but she liked to read the Bible and make fun of it to shock people. So now Minnie has the answer. She goes back and she's talking to Rafe and she knows no woman would throw away poetry that was written specifically for her, about her. And he asks Minnie if anyone's ever written her a love poem, and she says no, but she had received some poems before, and she'd kept them. But maybe Lord Melton burnt them if he found them. Rafe said he would have. If some smell smock had been sending my wife that class of thing... So smell smock is an obsolete appellation for a lecherous or promiscuous man based on a smock, a chemise, a woman considered sexually an immoral woman. In Courtesans and Colcolds, a glossary of Renaissance dramatic body, 1979, James T. Henke calls him a womanizer and whoremonger, smock smelling, also obsolete, referred to the activity of womanizing and whoremongering. There you go. Great word. Thanks, Diana Gabaldon. Learn something new today. So that'd be a great way to call somebody a name and no one would have any idea you were calling them whoremongering. <laughs> Smell smock. So Minnie doesn't think that Hal would have burnt the poems if he didn't burn the letters, but he probably hasn't seen them. And again, why didn't he burn the letters and kept all of them, including his own? She was still trying to put that together and hasn't figured it out yet. Maybe it's because he loved his wife and friend and mourned them. 
and he couldn't bear to part with them. His own letters were filled with heartbreaking grief. And she decides that Esme deliberately left the letters for Hal to find them. But the poems may be hidden, and they would be in a private place. And Rafe assures her that they cannot get back into Arga's house because they've been seen already. But she was wondering if they had a sister or a cousin, somebody who could pretend to be a maid. And Minnie offers up five pounds, which is six months worth of wages for a house servant. And he asks, are you wanting us to burgle the house or burn it down for all love? She simply wants Esme's Bible stolen because private letters, poems, things she wants nobody else to read are likely in it. Minnie is clever, clever girl. So the cousin did not have to steal the Bible. She was able, as the newly hired chambermaid, to go through the Bible and then put it chastely on the nightstand but she'd removed a handful of folded papers and put them in her pocket and just simply left, never to return. And they ask if there's anything useful. And Minnie says yes, and she hadn't slept at all the night before. And she yawned, and she handed a sealed letter with parchment cover addressed to Sir William Young, secretary at war. So when she got the letters the day before, she was on a mission. She found the poems. And she wants to make sure that Sir William gets that. And they made doe eyes at her, offended that she was telling them they might not get it. So she wants to make certain they will follow through with their job. So they left to get the letter delivered, and she was drinking Madeira, asking for the blessing of her mother's prayers before picking up her quill the night before. Though Nathaniel Twelve Trees was erotically inclined and had waxed lascivious in describing his mistress's charms, he also mentioned various aspects of the place in which the lovers had been, but he hadn't signed that one. But he had written yours forever, darling, at the bottom. And so she decided that she would write a poem that was from him to Esme. And she called it Love's Constant Flowering in Celebration of the 7th of April. And she ended it with Yours in the Flesh and in the Spirit, Darling Esme Nathaniel. So she wrote a poem, titled it, and then made sure it was signed Nathaniel. And she thinks she did a pretty good job of mimicking his writing. The poem that she wrote made it obvious that Hal had more than adequate grounds for challenging Nathaniel Twelve Trees to a duel, that the Countess had encouraged Twelve Trees' attentions, but... It did not reveal Esme's character or the painful intimacies of her husband. So she kept out the things, just like she had left out the details about Jamie Fraser to Edward Twelvetree's Mr. Bloomer. She had left out some details here as well. So now it was done. She has all the letters in front of her, spread, silent witnesses, and she wonders what to do with you? And she drank another glass of wine slowly. There were two things that she could do, burn them. But she can't do that because if the poem didn't work, that's the only evidence. And as a last resort, Harry Quarry could use them. And the other part was she didn't know why Hal had kept them in the first place regardless of why they had value to him and she couldn't burn them because he didn't. As she sits and the clock and the bells strike the hour, it is eight o'clock 
and she realizes she will have to put them back. Now, we don't know why she had to do it personally, but she maybe just wanted to make sure the job got done. And she didn't know it was from her mother's prayers or the benign intercession by Mother Maria Ana Agueda de San Ignacio, but in three days she got the opportunity. Earl Melton is holding a ball in honor of his mother's birthday. I think this is fascinating, this exchange between her and Lady Buford, that Hal was using strategic means by throwing this ball. His mother is in France. She's not likely coming back, but it's her birthday. And him having a big formal party is a way to show people that he is mentally normal and healthy because it's been four months since his wife died. And he's been under all this suspicion since he killed Nathaniel. And they're still under suspicion because of his father's, quote, suicide. I would encourage you, as a side note, to go through the Lord John books to really find out more about his father's death. So Hal is using this not only to show the normalcy in his life and that he's better and he's okay, he's recovered, and that he's capable of running the 46th Regiment and he wants to get it back up and running, but the friends of his mother's who would normally support him haven't been able to since his father's death and his mother going to France. And his mother comes from a really powerful Scottish family, the Armstrongs. Her father was Scottish, a lowlander. So this gives an opportunity for people on the social structure of the time to come and be supportive because it's a party in honor of his mother's birthday. And if they don't come, they're terrible friends and it will look bad. So it's a win-win for Hal, who is brilliant at these war games, at the social games. So many gets an invitation. Oh, and in the midst of this, she forgets that she's supposed to be husband hunting. She had already turned down a couple of proposals. And Lady Buford wants to have her prepared. And she tells Minnie to wear her very best because Lord Fairbairn is a widower. So Minnie's going to a party with hundreds of people. It's a formal gathering. I mean, like the prince will probably be there. The princess this is a big deal, right? Lots of influential people. And she's going to try and get these letters back into Hal's personal library office and get them back in the drawer where the O'Higginses said they got them from. Chapter 15, Burglary and Other Diversions. And by the way, I would have not been this cool and collected as many. I was a pretty go get em teenager. And at 17, I moved out of the house. So maybe I could have done this if I had the proper skills and training, but it scares me. It makes me shake thinking about her doing this. So the invitation came formally to Mademoiselle Wilhelmina Rennie. And it was a mistaken version, but it made her feel very uncomfortable if she should be caught. And her husband says it, her husband, sheesh, her father had told her, what if you are caught? Don't be afraid of unimagined possibilities. Imagine them and then what you'll do about them. Wise father. I don't know if he's actually got the best fathering skills, but he's definitely good at this business. <laughs> and he was right. So she wrote down every possibility she could think of and what she would do about it. She decided she would arrive late and so she could kind of move in with a group of young women and their chaperones so she wouldn't be noticed being alone. It would have been very unusual for a woman of her age to be going to a party such as this unaccompanied. So she had learned from Lady Buford the art of drawing men's eyes. She already knew the art of avoiding them. And she had her head modestly lowered and she hung about the edge and didn't speak. So she was unlikely to have people notice her. She's trying to be a, 
a wallflower. I have a feeling she's not easily a wallflower. So this has to be practiced behavior. And she sees soldiers in lavish uniform and notices Lord Melton instantly as though there was no other man in the room. Mm Hmm. I think Minnie has fallen in love with him and she still doesn't quite know it yet. She's definitely team Hal though. (laughs) She sees the prince and Harry Corey, and he was looking fine in his own uniform and Lord Fairbairn, a fierce looking small man. And he stood at Melton's elbow. And remember she had met with Duke of Beaufort. Well, he notices her and wants to spend time with her. And they danced before she retired to the ladies room for 15 minutes. So he would get bored and move on to someone else. When she comes back out, the group of men, the four of them had disappears, had disappears, had disappeared. And so she drifted around the room and couldn't see them still. Not the Scottish grandfather, Lord Fairbairn, not Harry Corey, not the prince, not Melton. So she couldn't do anything until he came back because they were probably in his library. (laughs) And she didn't want to risk walking into him. So Sir Robert came up to her and they danced. And in a half an hour, the men came back and they each reappeared with a look of accomplishment on their faces. So Hal's business had been successful and she'd hoped he would stay and celebrate with all the other people. She paid attention to everything, kind of made a mental map and she went to the library. She notices where everything is, as Mick had told her. And then we come to find out that she has lock picks with her because the top drawer, of course, is locked because it has things in it. So Rafe says it's easy. But here's the instructions, which I totally love. Just don't let yourself be hurried. Locks don't care for haste, and they'll define obstruct you if you try to rush them. Like women, Mick put in. (laughs) So she had to be patient and she had practiced with them on her own desk. And she was pretty confident doing this reverse burglary. But now she's not so confident being in the library with 200 witnesses, a stone's throw away, nerves of steel. The look on this desk was basically the same as the one that she had. But she had to work it and work it and work it. And she was not being successful quickly. So she took a break and she tried again. And now she was getting it. But she told herself, don't bloody rush. On the third try, she'd almost gotten it. She could feel that there were five pins and she had three. Each made a soft click. And then the doorknob turned behind her with a much louder click. She sprang to her feet and it was a footman coming in to collect the dishes that had been left. And she'd said she'd been feeling faint, you know, made up a woman's excuse, quote unquote. And he finally let her be. He didn't see the picks hanging out of the lock. So when he left, she got right back to work. She took breaths, but She did notice herself being hungry as well. (laughs) Oh, the digestion of a 17 year old. She's still starving. Now, mind you, she hasn't eaten, so she's hungry. That comes up later. So she keeps trying and keeps trying and she calms herself and it happens. She gets the lock picked. Her hands were shaking badly. And she grabbed the three parcels out of her pockets and put them in the drawer and slammed it shut. And just as she did that, she hears, what the devil are you doing? And she shrieks. It's none other than the Duke of Pardlow standing in the doorway with Harry Corey and another soldier. I say, 
Harry begins, because Harry knows her, and he has to pretend he doesn't. <laughs> the other man says, what's all this then? And the Duke says, to not trouble themselves, and he keeps his eyes fixed on her. He's going to take care of it, and he closes the door in their faces. That's funny. So he walks across the room, and he keeps his eyes fixed on her, and her sweat on her body was chilled to ice and he takes her by the elbow and moves her to one side and stares at the closed drawer with the pick lock still sticking out of it what the devil have you been doing and she tells him she's been robbing him so much must be obvious <laughs> and he asks her what is there to steal in a library and she notices there are at least a, six books that are worth a thousand pounds each. But he really did have a point because most people would not know that books were worth that much money. So she just simply says that the drawer was locked and why would it be locked if there was something? Why would it be locked if there wasn't something valuable in it? And then she realizes he had forgotten the letters were in there. And so he moves past her. Mm-hmm. And he wants to know exactly who she is and why she's here. I'm just a thief, your grace. I'm sorry. He doesn't believe her at all. And he tells her she's not going anywhere until she tells him what she's here for. She begins to feel a little bit lightheaded. And then he says, Edward Twelve Trees, did he send you? She says, no. And she tells him that he... He can search her, because all he's going to find is an unclean hanky and a little box of scent. If you want to search me, go ahead. <laughs> the boldness of many. So he makes her stand there, and he yanks the pick locks from the drawer, and he gets the key from his waistcoat and unlocks the drawer and pulls it out. She thinks she couldn't have put the letters in the right place because Mick hadn't paid attention to that. And she hears Hal say something under his breath in Latin. And he tells her to open her eyes and look at him. And he was vibrating with anger and wants to know what she was doing with his letters. And she just said, putting them back. And he looks at her and blinks. He saw her close the drawer. And then he wants to know how she got the letters in the first place. And she says, Mr. Twelve Trees, he did ask me to steal the letters. I wouldn't do it for him. You wouldn't? Why not? And she said, I liked you when we met at the princess's garden party. Indeed. And his cheeks became rosy. And she could tell that Mr. Twelve Trees did not like him. Yes, that's putting it mildly. And so he wants to know why Twelve Trees asked her to steal the letters. She says, not often. It's more that we, I discover information that may be of value, just inquiries here and there, you know, gossip at parties, that sort of thing. We, who are your confederates, may I ask? So she tells him it's a family business. And so... If she refused Edward Twelve Trees, he wants to know how she came in possession of the letters anyway. And she said somebody else must have stolen them for him. But she had been in his house and found them, and she recognized his name and realized that they were personal, so she didn't read them. And now he was envisioning Edward Twelve Trees greedily pouring over his letters. So she took him back. Now she's back to the truth. And he says, you took them back and thought you'd come put them back in my house. Why? I thought you might want them. He says, how very kind of you. Why didn't you just send them anonymously if your only intent was to return them? He's asking some interesting questions, to be sure. She tells him, she doesn't want him to be hurt. 
and he would be hurt if he thought somebody had read them. And he's trying to make sense of this. And she says, shall I prove it, your grace? And her hand reaches up to touch him. What? Prove it? So she gets on her toes, puts his, her hands on his shoulders, and kisses him softly. But she didn't stop. Her body moved toward him and his toward hers. Like plants turning toward the sun. More garden references. And at this, she found herself trying to get her petticoats off and her clothes off. And Hal's. This kind of scared her, but she was thinking of him as Hal. And his uniform coat struck the floor with a crash, buttons, epaulets, and gold lace, and he was ripping at his waistcoat buttons. And he says something in Latin. Who's insane, she says. Plainly you are. Do you want to change your mind? Because you have roughly ten seconds to do so. And she says it will take her longer than that to get her bum roll off. And he mutters, Irumabo, under his breath. And he gets the bum roll off. He just broke it. He throws off his waistcoat and pushes her onto her back. Now, onto the rug. And she wants to know what Irumabo means. Me too. You too what? So they're having this really discordant, um, less driven conversation. And she realizes the middle part of him was between her thighs, very warm, even through the moleskin breeches. I'm insane, he said. Oh, and Irumabo means fuck. It actually means to fuck you up, or I'm going to fuck you. But hey, I looked it up in a few different references. And she notes, three seconds later, he was alarmingly hot and terrifyingly immediate. And Jesus Christ, he said and froze, looking down at her, his eyes huge with shock. He doesn't think she's a virgin. Hmm. She says it hurt, shockingly, and she froze as well. And she felt him shift as if he was going to leave her, and she didn't want that. So she grabbed him by the bum, and it was tight and solid and warm, an anchor against the pain and terror, and she whispers, I said I'd prove it. And with all her strength, she pulled him in the rest of the way. And then they were gaping and gulping air like a pair of stranded fish. His heart was hammering. She could feel it under the hand she had on his back. And then he says, you've proved it. Whatever. What was it you wanted to prove again? <laughs> and to many, this is sort of a one night stand. She's thinking in her head. But she could barely breathe right now. And she smiled and says that I didn't want to hurt you. Oh. And she realizes he's not wheezing. <laughs> I didn't want, I didn't mean to hurt you either, he said. And he leans over and kisses her. And she says it doesn't hurt that much. And he calls her a liar. And he's about to leave or get up, and she says that he shan't. This is never going to happen again, so I mean to enjoy it. If such a thing is possible. He didn't laugh. And a smile with a trace of it reaching his eyes. Yes, it is. Let me prove it. There you go. See, the first time can be okay. He's going to make her like it. He's going to do the things. And then it says, some little time later... So she's up and dressed and she feels dazed. She can hear the sounds of the house and she's going down the back stairs. And she's so hungry. She can smell the food. And she notices that turkey carpet that is mentioned so many times when we see Argus house. 
Servants are everywhere. And for her, it was like walking through a soundless dream. You just kept walking. And he stops her. And he runs around the corner. And he comes back. And she notices she's feeling very drunk. But he put her cape over her. And then he kissed her fiercely. And then did it again. And then as he's putting her into a cab, he wants to know where she lives. And she lies and says she's in Southwark and gives a number. His face is white with his eyes dark in the night. And she notices the soreness between her legs. And it feels slippery, just like the rain on the lantern that's slick. He says he will call upon her tomorrow to inquire after her welfare. She doesn't answer. And down the road she goes. She couldn't think, and she felt the wetness seep into her petticoats. The sticky feel of blood. And the only thing she can think was the remark of her father's, the English are notorious bores about virginity. (laughs) So, I think Minnie proved that she didn't want to hurt him. And that's the end of chapter 15. He didn't know she was a virgin until he got to that very point. They didn't pull and pray, it seems like. So condoms were of uncommon use. Claire was a fan of using the wine-soaked sponges or the tansy oil-soaked sponges, and it would act as a pretty good spermicide or even lemon would work. So they'd had the first encounter, and then it seems like a pretty much more fun encounter after that. But she gave him a wrong address. He doesn't even have her real name. But I think Minerva is in love with Hal. She even shifted her thinking towards him. And he is greatly intrigued with her. And there's a spark, a definite spark. I think a love at first sight kind of thing. Not just at first lust. (laughs) And he certainly did take care of her burglaring, didn't he? So Hal is supposed to be somewhere about 25 years old, which would not have been considered a terrible thing with her being 17. Because at 17, many young women were already married. It was normal, 16, 17 years old. So an established man was considered a good thing. Because you'd have a household, there would be security, all of those things. And they often looked for a wife that was younger because of her fertility. Mm -hmm. Yes. And people didn't live as long either. It's a whole different cultural shift. Now we would really not be happy with a 17 year old and a 25 year old together because of the vast difference in age where then, and even looking at just her particular demeanor and aptitudes, they're not that far apart in age. I look forward to your emails and comments and even voicemails. You can email contact at a dram of outlander.com. When the post is up, you can comment on the social media pages or group or on the website post itself at a dram of outlander.com. Or you can call into the voice line 719-425- 9444. And how do you support the podcast? Share it. Share the posts. Share the iTunes links, Google Play, Stitcher. Tell people about the podcast. Join the Facebook group. You have to ask to join it. Follow the page, A Drama of Outlander on Facebook. 
on Twitter and Instagram, it's Dram of Outlander. On Tumblr, it's A Dram of Outlander. And of course, you can follow the website, adramofoutlander.com. Another way you can support the podcast is to comment, interact with others in the Adram of Outlander community, and give me your feedback. Of course, the other way for support is to financially support the podcast. I'm a solo person in doing all of this, and I have a patreon.com slash a of Outlander. We also have merchandise on redbubble.com under a dram of Outlander. Or if you want to do a one-time offering, you can just email or leave me a voicemail and I will tell you what you can do. We have one more episode in this podcast series, and then I will be going back and doing an overview of Voyager over the weeks following until season three comes out. I will pick out and highlight what I think are the main things that they will be covering from the book. It is very exciting and I've enjoyed doing this with you and I thank you so much for listening and I appreciate you as always every single week. And until next time, Slange Javah.